good evening everybody it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, very unusual meeting unusual for various reasons first is that this is for the first time that the department has taken the initiative of coming forward and volunteering to explain the very complex provisions by way of amendments to the uh, sections dealing with charitable trust in the last two finance acts finance act 21 and 22 so my special thanks to kamlesh ji who has not only volunteered to uh, come down to bombay but has also on our behalf extended the invitation to uh, neha ma'am and uh, anurag sir who are also going to enrich us with their knowledge and experience it is unusual also for another reason that it is for the first time that ifa is joining hands with the chamber of tax consultants and this meeting is held jointly between ifa western region and the chamber of tax consultants so this is also another first and this is for us for the first time when on a non international tax topic we are having more than 500 registrations for online participation and i welcome each one of you for the benefit of several non members i will mention that ifa is a organization based or having the headquarters in netherlands and it has got branches in more than 100 countries the indian branch has got chapters and sub chapters in delhi mumbai kolkata hyderabad chennai bangalore mumbai has got sub chapters at ahmedabad and pune and each chapter and sub chapter is very active in holding meetings or seminars or discussions on topics related to international tax and i all i invite all the non members to join ifa because apart from these local discussions there is a advantage of the annual congress which is held every year this year it is going to be held in september in berlin and it is a matter of pride and privilege that one of the uh, chapters the country report of one of the chapter topics to be discussed over there is co-authored by kamlesh sir and myself the members of ifa will be are also entitled to the uh, ifa careers which are the analysis of the various countries reports on the several topics which are discussed at the congress and each career is uh, containing a wealth of information so that is one thing which comes free of charge to the ifa members today in the first session uh, neha ma'am will uh, take us through the various amendments in the last uh, two finance acts and thereafter it will be followed by uh, panel discussion before i uh, request neha ma'am to start i'll request uh, paraj bhai to also welcome uh, or speak on behalf of the field thank you very much and good evening to all uh, Participants who are present here physically and also participants who are uh, uh, joined us virtually. It's a privilege for you know chamber to join hands with uh, FIFA and uh, you know as Dilip uh, said, I think it is the first time you know they are doing this. I am sure you know Dilip will continue to uh, do joint uh, you know program with uh, chamber uh, as other organizations as and when you know it is necessary. Uh, then about chamber uh, you know it's uh, in 97 years of its existence. and uh, uh, we are mainly uh, you know dedicated to the education in the area of direct tax indirect tax uh, and uh, you know allied uh, law uh, we both are charitable institutions sir so uh, you know, we all we, all, we are also in the institution also will be uh, you know impacted because of uh, the changes which are suggested it of course you know we all uh, feel that it is for good for the country that as a country you know we are moving towards more towards the compliance better compliance and better governance so it is in the interest of uh, the country and all the citizens uh, about the chamber you know chamber does various activities in terms it comes with a monthly journal it also comes with quarterly uh, international tax journal student journal and uh, it, it conducts various rrcs and programs so request uh, you know the people who are not the members of chamber to please go through our website and uh, if you find appropriate uh, do you know uh, join chamber uh, thank you sir
I request our treasurer Kush to introduce uh, Samrat sir and Neha ma'am. Uh, one of our speakers today is Samrat uh, Sahni sir, who is a 1990 batch member of the IIM. Uh, he he was an MBA from IIM Lucknow and has also taught there for four batches. He is also a law graduate and he has worked in the tax administration of Papua New Guinea for five years. Uh, he has expertise in tax policy and international taxation, and he is currently the joint secretary in the tax policy and the department of revenue. Uh, he was current he he was the first commissioner of advanced pricing agreement in India. And he played an important role in uh, rolling out the original idea. He is a regular speaker in various institutions and conferences. And thank you for the contribution. The main aspect of my name is uh, the under secretary in the CPL, the tax policy and legislation division of the Department of Revenue. Uh, he holds an uh, he holds uh, he was an assistant professor at the uh, Delhi University. In the economic department, and also the guest lecturer at Hindu College in Delhi University. Uh, he has worked as the deputy commissioner of income tax, assistant commissioner of income tax, for uh, years before the current role. He is also a research associate uh, at the Small Enterprise Finance Center in the uh, IFMR. He has worked at McKinsey uh, as an analyst before this, and he is going to take us to the presentation and the amendments related to the changes. Of the law for charitable entities. I hope I am audible. Can you start? Okay. So I would like to thank Eva for uh, having us today for this uh, presentation. Um, as all of us know, since um, Finance Act 20 and all the subsequent Finance Act, a lot of uh, So as I was saying, since Finance Act 20 and the subsequent Finance Act, um, a lot of um, amendments have been brought into the provisions relating to the um, regime uh, charitable trusts and institutions, both in uh, 1023C and Section 1112. Um, so uh, these amendments have been basically brought in to streamline the provisions, get both of the uh, parallel existing regimes aligned, and generally to Bring out some certainty, tax certainty. Um, so uh, this is what we are going to start off with today. So um, beginning with one of the significant amendments which the Finance Act 21 brought about was about how to treat the application out of corpus or from loan and borrowings. So in certain instances, it had been observed that uh, the trusts and institutions were claiming excess application, and was all, they were also treating it as a carry forward of it. But uh, conceptually, um, this is uh, not in line with uh, the intent of the provisions, as uh, the corpus donation, as in the case of loan and borrowing, those receipts which the trust receives, they are not income. So as a result of it, when they were claiming the um, Expenditure or application out of it, there was a scenario of a double benefit that the trust and institution were claiming. So, um, which is why uh, the Finance Act 21, as is mentioned on the slide, has deferred the counting of application out of corpus from the year of application to the year when the corpus is replenished from that year income. So, I think this would be clear with this example, which is on the slide. So, for example, in the first year, if a trust or institution receives a corpus donation of 50, that is exempt, and a non-corpus donation of 100, then the mandatory application of income of 85% is to be computed based on the non-corpus donation, which is 85. But if the trust and institutions, what they were doing, what they were applying, five plus the 50, so that the actual application being undertaken was 135. And hence, there was an excess application of 50. But now, with the amendments that have been brought about in Finance Act 21, the actual application will be treated as 85 only. So, in the year two, similarly, with, if the amendment had not taken place, if there was no corpus donation, 
and um, there was a non corpus donation of 200 then the 85 percent is 170 um, and suppose the actual application was 120 then prior to the amendments they could have claimed the extra application of 50 which was undertaken in the last year but as um, I just mentioned that this is not um, logically consistent and conceptually in line with why we gave exemption to these trusts, which is why uh, this amendment has been brought in. And I think so with. Uh, thank you, Neera. Uh, basically, you know, this presentation we are making to set the ground. A uh, lot of uh, misconception is, uh, you know, amongst the mind of stakeholders uh, that uh, provisions related to trust have been made more onerous. So what we are trying to explain is that whatever were the misuse initially, those misuses have been plugged or there was some alignment required to be made, those alignments have been done and that Neha will explain in subsequent slides. Wherever uh, there was uncertainty, that means assessing officer didn't know if there is a violation, what should he do? Stakeholder didn't know that if there is a violation by them, what would be the result? Now, this uh, uh, particular act, Finance Act 2022, has given a clear guideline to the tax administration as well as the taxpayers that in this particular kind of violation, this will be the result. So that is a kind of tax certainty which each taxpayer can expect from legislature and that has been provided. So first of all, the presentation is trying to tell you the basic philosophy behind all these amendments in Finance Act 2020 and Finance Act 2021 and 2022. Now coming to this example, this is a very you know good example which has been This is a very good example and uh, we can actually uh, see, uh, you know, the point that we are trying to make. A lot of uh, doubts are in the mind of taxpayers that uh, how, uh, you know, this uh, particular provisions of the law which was introduced last year is going to operate and it is going to impact the calculation of their taxable income. So what is being tried to explain here, you know, it's very important. If you look at year one, basically the uh, trust has income of only 100 rupees because 50 rupees, the corpus donation is not an income, but he has, uh, he has applied 135. So in a normal situation, what he would have done, he would have said that I have incurred a loss of 35. Now there is a no concept of loss when charitable activity is concerned. This is not a commercial, uh, you know, uh, enterprise where you incur more expenditure than the income that you have in your hand. That will happen because uh, you have to basically build your business enterprise for the future. And for that, you get support from uh, your shareholders in the form of equity support, and you get support from the borrowing that is the kind of leverage you have for your commercial organization so that leverage uh, the borrowing and your equity support uh, uh, helps you to side over the law situation uh, the uh, you know that is a commercial organization for trust simple thing is whatever donation you receive or whatever income you have from your assets that you are already with you like interest income or dividend income you use that uh, income and uh, for charitable activity. There is absolutely no occasion to have excess application can only happen when you take donation or you take borrowing. That is not your income. If that is not your income, the amount you spend from that cannot be your application. Simple concept. First of all, when you uh, look at uh, the normal taxation principle that when you have an exempt income the expenditure which is incurred to earn exempt income is not allowed as deduction that's a basic philosophy of taxation of course trusts are different from income and ex expenditure because here you have income and application expenditure happens before income but here application happens after income 
but concept remains same that if expenditure is incurred to earn an income exempt income is not allowed as deduction application out of something which is not an income is not an application so the same concept it has it, it was always there you know it was not stated specifically so in the income tax act but that's a general uh, you know understanding that how can uh, you have application out of something which is not your income so that has been brought in here uh, so now when we said that in year 1 when you receive purpose donation of 50 and you apply that purpose donation of 50 for charitable activity then that is your not your application our calculation on year 1 application is only 85 now when you to in year 2 you are short of application that means because you have applied only 120 while you are you were required to apply 170 now on the earlier what people used to do that they did excess application out of corpus in the earlier year they used to carry forward and write it off here so that uh, you know everything is all right but if you combine year 2 and you will see the discrepancy because see that has been reduced to zero but in your books corpus is 50 but you don't have that corpus with you and you how much did you specify in one year and uh, 17 uh, uh, 120 another year 205 you spent 205 but you were required to spend 255 but still everything is all right you don't have to accumulate do the law requires that 50 should have been accumulated because you did not apply so you see that uh, problem here which was there earlier now this problem had to be rectified and therefore what has been done is that donation or loan and borrowing it is not your income when money comes in it is not your income when you apply out of that it is not an expenditure or it is not an application i mean expenditure is not a concept interest it is not an application that means next year when you replenish this corpus now this is extra what we have provided that is year 2 alternative this is actually beneficial to the taxpayer the legislature could have stopped there itself that means you spend out of corpus it is not an application end of the story full stop but legislature was concerned that sometime it does happen that there is an emergency you have to spend from your corpus because you don't have money with you but there is a requirement to do some charitable activity immediately so you use that corpus but now you want to replenish that corpus so next year when you get a corpus donation which is your income and then from that income you convert it it to the corpus then it should be an application now that is a genuine demand any taxpayer will have and therefore this alternative scenario which is there in year 2 is response to that genuine demand by the legislator but then there is a catch here is it going to be only on paper that i receive donation and i convert it into uh, you know corpus you know you all are chartered accountant you know if uh, we do not write in the income tax act that it should be parked in a specific fund separate identifiable fund then it becomes only a paper entry and therefore that requirement was brought in in 111d that corpus must be uh, put in 115 specifically separately for that purpose so that is a background that because legislature wanted to provide you an alternative that you don't don't accumulate this 50 you just convert this 50 in year 2 because you have money left with you in year 2 because there is a shortfall you have money left with you so if you want to accumulate you accumulate or if you don't want to accumulate you convert that into corpus but convert into corpus not as a paper entry you actually show us that now this is corpus see it is this particular instrument i have converted and once you do that then you get all the benefit and that is that is the logic behind putting putting that word in 111d that uh, what is that word that uh, is specified so it should be specific 115 so that is the background you know why uh, all these amendment was done 
and when those amendments were done uh, basic objective was to rectify the misuse of the provision which was happening but while doing that legislature was mindful of the fact that we also have to give an opening to the taxpayer to recoup the corpus now the question is how do we read this amendment from which year it shall apply so let us uh, you know read 11 1d what does it say yeah 111d says and the amendment in 111d was from finance act 2021 with effect from assessment year 22 23 so how do we read this you know people say whether it will apply to a year corpus or it will apply to new corpus so i'll just try to explain you how do you read a particular amendment now the legislature the finance act says that this will apply from assessment year 22 23 Although Finance Act only says that it will apply from 1/4 2022, but when we go to notes on classes or explanatory memorandum, we come to know whether it applies from a particular date 1/4 2022 or whether it applies from assessment year 22 23. And when we go to notes on classes, when we go to explanatory memorandum, you will see it is written there that it applies from assessment year 22 23. That means when you open the Income Tax Act for assessment year 21 22, this amendment is not there. 111d only says income in the form of voluntary contribution made with a specific direction that they shall form part of the corpus that's it that means if this is satisfied for assessment year 21 22 then for that year assessment year 21 22 it is not your income that's it matter ends when you come to the next year assessment year 22 23 that particular year is over that amount that you received of donation is over and it was not counted your income so unless there is another provision like 13 1d you will see we cannot count that as your income again now the new provision says subject to the condition that such voluntary contributions are invested or deposited in 115 maintained specifically for that purpose this condition the moment you open income tax act for assessment year 22 23 this condition is there so that means from 14 2021 onward assessment year 22 23 means financial year 21 22 if you receive a corpus donation it will be exempt under 111d only when this condition is satisfied so if the question is that before 14 2021 i have already received corpus donation and it was made exempt under the then provision of 111d should i should i now put that into 115 specifically for that answer is no it is not required that is how you read the law now the question is that all this replenishment and all it is there in explanation 4 so let us read that now explanation 4 that means this this condition that when you apply from donation corpus when you apply from corpus then it is not your application this explanation 4 was also inserted from 14 2021 but from assessment year 22 23 same thing now question is i have a corpus of past year i have a corpus of current year when i apply from this corpus that past corpus and current corpus will this restriction that it will not be counted as application will it apply only for the current corpus or will also apply for the past sorry it will apply to both the corpus why because when i open the income tax act for assessment year 22 23 explanation 4 says that application for charitable or religious purpose from the corpus it is not saying which corpus because now your corpus is past as well as current application from corpus shall not be treated as application of income i mean there is no distinction whether it is past corpus or current corpus so that means even if you are you have a past corpus you make an application out of it then it is not counted as application maybe from the past corpus you made an application it is not counted as application in next year you recoup the corpus 
now that has to be specifically invested in 115 because now when you are recouping that corpus you are making use of explanation 4 that he says that then you have to go to the new 11 uh, 11 1d that it must be maintained specifically for that corpus now you cannot say that my old corpus was not specifically for 115 so now when i am re recouping it uh, can it, it can be that way no now the new law says that you have to uh, that whatever you are putting back in corpus has to be in specific specific 115 mode so these basic facts i just wanted to explain because once these basic understanding is clear lot of questions that are going to come up later uh, you know it will be easy to give answer to those questions thank you thank you sir so um okay so now uh, moving on to the amendments made by finance act 22 so um as i mentioned earlier that we have currently two existing parallel regimes which govern um charitable trust funds or institutions and um, though they are parallel um regimes there were um, some conditions in uh, one of the regimes like both these parallel regimes were not really aligned so what finance act 22 has tried to do is really try to bring both these regimes on the same platform in terms of the conditions which are applicable to these trusts or institutions irrespective of the fact which regime that they are uh, registered or approved under so some of the alignments which we which have been undertaken are mentioned on this slide the first one is that uh, the period of accumulation um the provisions of the act allow that the uh, trust or institution if they cannot apply 85% of their income they have a period of 5 years for which they can accumulate it or set apart so for the trusts or institutions which were registered under section um, 11 or 12 they had to file a form number 10 giving uh, the purpose for accumulation the duration for accumulation whether um, this amount which has been set apart is invested in the 115 mode so on and so forth but this these conditions were not applicable to the trust or institution under 1023c so the first amendment which has been brought about is that this uh, form 10 and all the information which goes into that has now been made applicable to them um this rule has uh, also been notified recently so um this uh, will be applicable from the next year from 1st april 23 um so now all the trust institutions in uh, 1023c will also have to give this purpose for which they are accumulating the period uh, whether the uh, amount set apart is invested is in, in 115 mode so on and so forth and um, yeah so similarly explanation 4 has been inserted which deems the uh, violation as income or uh, when the application uh, ceases to be accumulated for the object which has been um, accumulated for um similarly now the explanation 5 as was already in the case of uh, 11 and 12 it enables the ao to allow the accumulated income to be applied for any other purpose uh, this provision is also now applicable to the trust and institution under 1023c uh another difference which existed was while the period of accumulation for both the regimes was 5 year there was a bit of a discrepancy in the year of taxation in the scenarios that uh, this income could not be applied so for the trust institutions under 1023c it was uh, to be taxed in the fifth year which is the last year till which the accumulation is allowed but in the case of the trust institutions registered under 1112 the taxability was uh, after the expiry of 5 years so it was in the 6th year so to bring both these regimes on the same uh, platform uh, in both these cases now the taxability will be uh, in the 5th year next slide um similarly uh, 1112 has um, it had detailed provisions about uh, how uh, 
uh, the treatment of unreasonable benefit being passed on to a specified person, um, which is essentially a related party. But uh, there was no conditions as such imposed uh, in the case of the trust for institutions um, approved under 1023C. Now they have been made applicable. The 21st proviso has been um, inserted and it speaks about uh, the unreasonable benefit if it is passed on to a specified person. It will be taxed and we will see how it will be taxed. Um, and all the um, provisions relating, which are given in section 13, uh, also apply to the trust institution in uh, 1023 c And um, in addition to the amount of unreasonable benefit, now there is also a new section. It's a penal provision which has been introduced that um, earlier, if any unreasonable benefit was passed on to these related parties, the exemption was denied. But in addition to this denial of exemption or deemed taxation, now there is also a penalty which is to be imposed under Section 271 AAE. Uh, the first case, first violation is 100% of the amount of benefit which is passed on. And for the repeated subsequent violations, it's 200% of the violation. So um, we'll see this again in. Uh, moving in the how um, the taxation of certain incomes at the 30 percent that we've introduced similarly 115 td which talks about the taxation of e-credited income uh, this was only applicable to the trust institutions in 11 12 and it did not apply to 1023 c now it has been made applicable and um, filing of return by entities claiming exemption uh, was compulsory uh, for 11-12 trust institutions, and now it has been made compulsory even for the trust institutions in 1023C. This has been given in the 22nd proviso. Um, the procedure for cancellation of um, registration it required a reference uh, from the AO2 to the prescribed authority in 11 and 12 uh, for the trust institutions under 11 and 12. Now the same is also like the procedure for cancellation of registration of approval has also been made similar for both the regimes and a reference is mandatory to the prescribed authority. So as uh, we started out by saying that these whatever amendments have come across, it ha they have been brought about for alignment and also to provide clarity in how um, um, taxation should happen in the regime, especially in situations of violations. There were certain confusions when certain violations of conditions would lead to denial of exemption or they would lead to denial of like cancellation of registration. So both of them have different implications, but there was no consistency across the board, leading to a lot of litigation and general confusion. Um, and if there is a denial of exemption, do we tax the gross receipts or do we do give some benefit for the actual expenditure if it has been incurred for genuine purpose? So to streamline everything and to provide certainty, now there are essentially three ways to look at how any violation would be taxed. So the first bucket is where certain violations would lead to something as we have defined a specified income and they would be taxed at a special rate of 30 percent under 115 BDI. That defines, this section defines what specified income is and it is a special rate of tax which does not allow for any deduction, um, relief, carry forward, no such thing. The second bucket is where in case of certain violations your registration will continue and um, the denial of exemption would be there but your net income would be taxed. So to this effect, um, subsection 10 to section 13 and 11 have been inserted, and the 22nd and the 23rd proviso of um, clause 23C talk about this. And the final is that uh, in certain cases which we call specified violations, the registration or the approval will be cancelled. So this is very clear cut defined that this is a specified violation and the AO will know that in these cases, wherever it is observed, a reference has to be made to the prescribed authority.
So uh, 115 BVI, which is uh, taxing a certain income at the rate of 30%, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, no deduction in respect of any expenditure or allowance. So what, uh, when the specified income arrives, um, first instance, when there is accumulation without Form 10. So in the Form 10, when you state you accumulate for a certain purpose, if there is any violation in respect of that, then that would lead to um, specified income. Um, if they cease to be remain uh, invested in the specified modes and forms as given in 11.5, not applying for the purpose stated. Uh, the important thing to note in 115 BBI is that the uh, only that portion of income would be taxed which has been um, found to be, you know, uh, given unreasonable benefits or the amount of income which has not been applied in 11.5, for instance. So it is not going to be a complete taxation or complete um, uh, denial of exemption. So we have used the word to the extent it is not uh, invested in 11.5 or to the extent the unreasonable benefit has been given. So um, that is, um, so 13.1c is benefits to specified person, as we mentioned earlier, that will be, that amount of unreasonable benefit will be taxed at 30%. And uh, similarly, application outside India, um, uh, other than in which, so it's uh, any application which is incurred outside, which is not approved under 11.1c. So that amount would be taxed at 30%. Um, so the second bucket is when the registration will continue, certain violations have occurred, but we would, in these situations, the net income would be taxed, so certain expenditure would be allowed in computing uh, the income. So the violation which will fall into this bucket is the violation of the proviso to uh, clause um, 215, which is that in case of charitable activity, uh, being advancement of any object of general public utility, any activity in the nature of trade, commerce, services related thereto should be undertaken in the course of actual carrying out of such advancement of any other object. And the aggregate receipts from such activity is not more than 20% of the total receipt. So in certain years, it can happen and it does happen that the aggregate receipts from such activities, even if they are in the normal course, can exceed 20%. So in such cases, uh, for that year, the registration will continue, but the exemption will not be granted, but the income will be computed on a net basis. The other violations would be not maintaining prescribed books of account. Um, this rule has also been notified recently. We will come to that. Not getting the books of account audited if it's required. Uh, it's mandatory for uh, trust institutions above the basic exemption limit if they have their income. And not furnishing the return of income in time. So the expenditures which would be allowed in certain situations uh, is to be computed after deducting application as expenditure. And uh, the normal disallowances of CDS and the cash under 40AI, uh, 1I and 40A3 would apply. Subject to the condition that such expenditure is again not from the corpus or loan or borrowing, following from the example that we had uh, spoken about in our first slide. Uh, the other condition is that uh, any depreciation in respect of an asset whose acquisition had been claimed as application in any year, that would not be allowed. And uh, such expenditure should not be in the form of uh, any contribution or donation to any person. So, uh, and in this scenario, no deduction in respect of any expenditure or allowance or set off of loss is allowed any, under any other provision. So it's only um, in these, um, the application, the self-contained code, that would be granted. Next, please. So just uh, one more thing here. You know, apart from the fact that uh, legislature classified all violation into three buckets and gave a clear direction that these will be the consequences. Two of that has already been covered by Neha. She is going to cover the third one. But before that, just look at the second bucket of violation. You know, earlier, when assessing officer used to deny you exemption, he used to tax your gross donation as income. 
because there is a view a legitimate view that application is not expenditure section 37 or section 57 they say that expenditure incurred to earn an income but application is after income so if you strictly apply the requirement of section 37 or 57 you will find application will fail the test of deductibility as expenditure so one can argue that if assessing officer were taxing your gross donation as income they were actually correct maybe you know bit harsh i agree but legally there was a, uh, you know they had a basis now that has also been corrected we said application will be allowed as expenditure so 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 something you need to understand that while giving clarity the legislature was also very very reasonable so the final bucket is the uh, bucket of specified violations these are the scenarios which have been provided in the law in which the registration or the approval will be referred for cancellation to the prescribed authority so these specified violations are um if the application of income is for any uh, purpose other than the objects of the trust or the institution if the income from the profit and gains of business which is not incidental to the objects or if separate books of accounts have not been maintained for any uh, the business which is incidental if the application has been for private religious purposes which was not in your benefit to the public or if the application has been for the benefit of a particular religious community or caste non genuine activity or violation of any other condition of registration approval um or if the there has been a violation of any other law um and such order has not been disputed or has become final um these violations uh also in the past uh, even prior to these amendments these violations would have perhaps triggered a reference for cancellation of registration what we have done this year now is we have clearly provided it in the statute that these are the cases which would lead to uh, a reference for cancellation of uh, registration or approval so there is nothing um, significantly new apart from bringing about clarity um after um, the reference has been made Uh, the principal CIT or CIT has to cancel the registration on its own or from a reference. The principal CIT can also do it just through a motto if he notices the uh, any specified violation has occurred. Um, he has to pass an order in writing within six months um, from the end of the quarter of the first notice issued. Um, for notices issued prior to the current financial year and which are still pending. they have uh, been deemed to be issued in the first quarter of this financial year and the order is required to be passed even um, when uh, the principal cit thinks that no violation has occurred so whether rejecting uh, whether cancelling the registration or rejecting it an order has to be passed and the time period from the date of the reference um, to the principal cit order is uh, can be excluded from the limit, while cam- computing the limitation period of uh, doing assessment um the another amendment which has been again clarified this is no new uh, position in law is uh, but because it was um, a lot of references was received with regards to how application is being um, accounted for on an accrual basis now it has been explicitly provided in the statute that it has to be uh, counted on an accrual basis ad sir has explained that the application comes after income so um the concept of accrual and uh, and does not really fit the application so because there was a general confusion and it was being um, um stated again and again so now it has been in the statute that application can only be counted on an actual basis um another amendment which has been brought in for um, both the regimes um is um, the prescribed books of account 
So there was a requirement for the audit of the trust and the institution if their income after giving effect to all the provisions, the relevant provisions was above the minimum um, basic exemption limit of 2.5 lakh. But there was no um, list or, or the, the, the books of account were not prescribed. So now it is mandatory for them to also maintain a prescribed books of account. This uh, Rule 17AA has been notified recently, Notification 94, uh, dated 10th August. And uh, this uh, rule basically lists out all the records which a trust or institution is required to maintain. Um, these books of accounts are, again, something which a normal trust and institution would be maintaining or a chartered accountant would be auditing or an AO would also be referring to these while undertaking the assessment. We have just uh, prescribed them. So again, nothing new, but it is an exhaustive list. So I will just read out what these books of account include. They include the cash book, ledger, journal, original, and copies of bills. Uh, the same needs to be maintained for any business undertaking um, being carried out by the trust institution. Um, record of all the projects and institutions which are run by the trust. Um, Record of all the income. This will include voluntary contributions, income derived from property, and any other income. Um, then we have details of application, uh, donation to other charitable entities, application outside India, uh, details of deemed income, uh, accumulation of income, money invested in 11.5 modes, not invested in 11.5 modes. Uh, details of application out of accumulated income. So we are um, we have uh, given separate requirement that application has to be the uh, details have to be maintained separately for applications from this year's income and also of uh, past year's income. Um, details of corpus donation application out of it amount credit replenished or credited back uh, out of the current year income. Donation to other charitable entities invested in 11.5 or not invested in 11.5. This is again in, in, in line with the amendment which we got in Finance Act 21. Um, another thing, uh, record which is as a result of one of the amendments that we have brought out in Finance Act 22, uh, records have to be maintained for the amount received for repair renovation of uh, under ATG2B of a religious place, which is being treated as corpus subject to certain conditions, details, to be maintained for the application out of it, amount credited back out of current year income, donation to other charitable entities, similar, so on and so forth. Uh, details of loan and borrowing receipt, application repayment, details of property, de record of specified person and transactions with them. So complete who are your specified people and the complete list of all the transactions that the trust institution has undertaken with those people. So just, uh, uh, you know, speaking on this, uh, I had, what, when we had notified this rule 17 AA, so I had received uh, uh, some emails from uh, our friends that, uh, you know, uh, these uh, details are necessary, uh, but uh, probably there is a need for a bit relaxation in the case of small taxpayers. So on that, I would like to clarify two points. Uh, first point is that, uh, that it is a legislative requirement, it is not a delegated legislation because the law says that uh, at least trust or institution or fund uh, who has receipts of more than 2.5 lakhs has to maintain books of account. So that is something if uh, that, uh, so if that request is to be considered, that will require an amendment in the Act and there is a different procedure for that. Now coming to the uh, you know justification of uh, the books of account that have been prescribed, you know what we feel that every book of account that we have written they might run into a few pages, say seventeen double A, but each of the item there is something which is necessary for you to calculate taxable income. Now if a ledger is to be maintained, if voucher is to be maintained, if bill is to be maintained or, uh, you know, whatever we have uh, uh, prescribed that uh, proper solution you have to maintain, whether you have invested in 11.5 or you have not invested in 11.5. Uh, so, you know, all that. Now, if, if, if uh, the uh, income tax rule 17AA is asking you 
to keep separate uh, ledger, separate uh, bills for business undertaking and non-business undertaking, because the law says that uh, uh, business must be incidental and separate books of account must be maintained. You know that is a requirement of the law. Then, if voluntary contribution detail is to be maintained, that is a requirement of law because that is your income. If uh, uh, how that uh, uh, you know income is applied on a particular project, if that is to be maintained because that is uh, how you are. Uh, we, are we are going to check whether you have, have applied 85 percent of your uh, total income or not. And if you have accumulated, if you have not applied 85 percent, if you have accumulated, then we have we are asking you to keep that uh, detail of accumulation. So. Each and every item, you know, that is there uh, might look to be onerous, but it is something which, which uh, you should have already been doing it. Because if you were not doing it, then it, from our perspective, it was virtually impossible for you to calculate taxable income of that person. So all that document, and I'm we are willing to receive suggestions. You point out any one document that we have prescribed, which. You were not relying upon before this notification to calculate taxable income. You know, we are we are willing to uh, you know uh, hear you out and uh, listen that uh, that document is unnecessary. You know, so uh, you know, see from that perspective, whatever has been prescribed is something which law says is required for you to calculate taxable income. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. I think uh, you have set the tone for the panel discussion. We are now uh, coming to the second part of the session. And before that, I'll request uh, Abhikan Mehta to introduce the remaining three speakers. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Sri Anurag Sai belongs to the 1991 batch of Indian IRS, presently working as Principal Chief Commissioner Exemptions, Mumbai. He has worked within the department in various capacities at Kolkata, Bangalore, and Chennai. On deputation to Ministry of Defence, Sri Sai has worked as the Chief Vigilance Officer of uh, Messrs. Hindustan Aeronautical Limited. He was awarded National Vigilance Excellence Award 2013 and Vigilance Innovation Award 2014. He Shai is an alumni of Jawaharlal Nehru Institute University, New Delhi, and NLU, Bangalore. He Shai was awarded the prestigious Fulbright uh, Fellowship for 2014-15 and pursued public policy at the University of Washington, USA. Thank you, Mr. Shai, for joining us today. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Yogesh Thar. He is currently partner at Banshi S. Mehta, a leading firm of chartered accountant in Mumbai. He is a fellow member of Institute of Chartered Accountants. He has worked for 38 years, acquired specialization in areas of corporate taxation, non resident and foreign companies, business mergers and acquisitions, and restructuring. He started his career with VS Gatalia Chartered Accountants. As a newly qualified chartered accountant in 1984, he then practiced nearly for a decade as sole proprietor and as a partner of RS Kardakya before joining Banshi as Mehta in 1997. He was a visiting faculty at NN Institute of Studies during period 92 to 97. He served as joint editor to Bombay Chartered Accountant publication Referencer from Diary for 97 to 2008. Mr. Thar has served as a member of Committee Institute constituted by Bombay High Court in 2014 in relation to a major commodity market stem in the country. Mr. Thar is presently a member of Taxation Committee of Chamber of Tax Council. We welcome you, Jay, sir. Yeah. Sri Gautam Nayak. He is in practice since 1968. He is a partner of the firm CNK Associates LLP, formerly known as Contract Nayak and Krishnadwala. Presently, uh, he has held various positions at uh, various uh, organizations, including President of BCA for the year 2004-2005, uh, 
editor and joint editor of BCA Journal from 2005 to 2010. He has various publications which he has authored, including the fourth edition of Transaction in Sales and Securities, co-authored uh, Taxation of Charitable Trust, published by BCA, revised ICI publication in relation to Taxation of Charitable Trust, co-authored the ICI Technical Guide on ICDS. He has written various articles and has been a regular contributor at uh, BCA Journal. We welcome Gautam sir. Before we start the most interesting session, I will be feeling my duty if I miss out on a very important task. I will request uh, Hitesh Bhai to hand over a momento to Kamlesh sir. I'll request uh, Harish Bhai to hand over to Neha ma'am. Parag Bhai to hand over to Anurag sir. Push to hand over to Gautam. And finally, I will hand over to you again. So I now request uh, Gautam and Yogesh to take up the questions one by one, which will be addressed by Savashi and uh, Mr. Anurag. Nilesh, President of the Chamber of Parag, uh, other office bearers of the two organizations, uh, Mr. Kamlesh Vaishni, uh, Mr. Anurag Sahai, and uh, Ms. Neha Sahai. I think uh, the presentation which was made explained clearly the logic, and uh, I think, uh, frankly, the issues of deficit, loan, cost of spending, all that has been rightly rationalized. I think uh, that is something which was uh, uh, you know, I think uh, clarity is there that yes, we can do that. Uh, you know, how that you will not get a double deduction. That there was a situation perhaps in the past where effectively some SSEs have uh, taken the benefit of a double deduction. Uh, and rightly, sir, I think uh, section 1310 is a welcome provision. I think it's something which has given a lot of relief uh, to a large number of trusts, particularly where the provider to 215 was being. Uh, uh, or where the return was a few days late, etc. So I think that is something I think uh, so which is most welcome. The only uh, issues I think which we need to look at uh, is there are some practical difficulties which come in, and because of the language of the section, uh, and that is those are the issues I think which we try to highlight over here. So one point uh, which may, uh, was made about uh, you know so far the past corpus and the current corpus is concerned. So I think it would be good if the CBDT were to clarify that any investments which you make as corpus investment will proceed towards the current corpus. And it should not be that the officer says, I will treat it towards the recruitment of the past corpus. You know, so that is the first uh, distinction. So that because today what will happen is the logical this is that say assuming I have spent half my corpus in the past, out of 10 lakhs I have spent 5 lakhs. So I have a block of uh, only 5 lakhs. So therefore when I today I get another 3 lakh corpus investment to the year and I make an investment on 3 lakhs, that three lakh should be out of the current year corpus first, and then if any, it should be towards the recoupment of the past corpus. So that is the one thing which uh, needs to be kept in mind because otherwise, that is something which will give rise to some further uh, litigation there. Because right, I think this is uh, an issue which probably we will have to you know examine. I can't uh, give you a clear answer right now because this is something you know what you are admitting that your book is saying five crore of purpose but you don't have purpose with you you know so that is a situation and then tomorrow you receive a new purpose uh, which is 10 crore so your book says 15 crore but you actually have 10 crore of purpose only so how do we uh, treat that investment you know these are the issues uh, which need examination and uh, you know uh, as you understand, uh, the, uh, there is uh, some gap here, and that gap has been created because uh, some of the trusts, and I have been, uh, you know, told that 
not all trusts have followed this practice some trusts were uh, quite honest uh, and uh, when they spent it from the corpus they did not treat it as an application uh, so uh, let us see how we need to you know uh, probably uh, you know give explanation on this uh, there is definitely a gap here and that gap has been created because uh, corpus has been used for application uh, and uh, you know uh, claiming access application you know so let us see how do we go about it uh, so i think let's come to the questions which have been framed uh, one of the points here was about uh, a trust pending for uh, any any part of its income for other than its office so very often what happens is that you have a trust which is purely for say educational purpose or uh, you know a trust whose objects are something different but it went say when there's a public disaster or something like that they donate to the state chief minister relief fund or the prime minister relief fund of a covid has happened in recent times now that uh, i think uh, the question is and that is a small amount of the total income the income as in this example which is given is the income is 10 crores and 1 lakh rupees donation is given Now, should there not be a threshold just like as in 215 today provided to 215 you have a 20% threshold should there not be a threshold which is there that uh, you know if you spend more than x percentage of your income it, uh, for other than your object it's only then that it will get attracted not if you for a minor small expenditure so that is the uh, issue thank you for your question uh, before i answer that question uh, let me get my two minutes to speak From finance act 2020 onwards, these three finance act is what I will call the holy trilogy in terms of changes which has been made in the realm of charitable institutions. So, right from how institutions were registered here in up to 2019-20, and how they are registered now, how there is certainty not in terms of just registration, there are fixed timelines. But also, you know, amplification when and how these will be cancelled. There are timelines imposed not just on you, but uh, my colleague sitting here has imposed timelines on us also. So those timelines are in terms of granting you registration under Section 12A B for uh, within six months, passing a speaking order, either cancelling or refusing to cancel. Within a specified time, assessments being uh, kept in abeyance till the time a decision is taken. I mean, there are so many amendments which have just clarified and which has reduced the scope of litigation. Whether it is just to welcome, uh, uh, you know, concept of uh, specified income in section one fifteen BBI, where where you know if you are getting into that, what is the hit you are going to pay? Because it is not dependent on subjective interpretation of uh, uh, the assessing officer, and similarly, as Gautam uh, admitted, Section 1310 coming in, it brings in so much of certainty, so much of surety as to if that provider is getting invoked, then how it is going to be taxed? Because earlier either the gross receipt would be taxed, or sometimes someone would be charitable and. You know, exclude the capital, or someone would include the depreciation. So there were different ways in which people were going about it. Now there is so much of certainty and so much of uh, you know confidence, I think. And one more important thing: this amendment, this amendment. I. Getting it in ten to trust the taxpayer that filing the will be making the right. Going to get twelve or. Sitting in the comfort yeah. home, so these are the criminal things, and I think it's sitting in their landscape, and so you would 
that yes, there are certain timelines being imposed on you also, but the same timelines are on us also. So together we have to work and uh, make this team a very efficient one. Yes, in calculation, in the system side, which we have been taking care and you see CBDT and Team PPL and the very abstract there has been issues where there was a 10 AC issue uh, where the nomenclature of provisional was coming in uh, in regular registration. So there circular 11 was brought out, it was notified and in what problem was sorted. Similarly, you see CBDT has come up with so many technical uh, demands which are being raised for uh, default in uh, uh, filing of various uh, statutory forms, audit reports and accumulation reports, etc. So, and these condonations are used liberally by the field format. Without asking you to come and visit the office, you are filing a petition and you are getting the decision. So there is a change in, in the way we are administering at field level also. And I hope that together we can make this scheme uh, workable. Yes, there will be uh, issues if you need to be resolved. It's always work in progress. But as you know, they say life is also work in progress. We learn each day. So there will be issues which you will point out and EPL and will consider, the board will consider and come up with responses. I hope we take this opportunity to look ahead, to look at the issues which may emerge from the new uh, changes and amendments made, rather than get into, you know, specific or micro issues which may be relevant to one or two or four uh, SSEs. Uh, let's look at the larger scope and uh, then try and benefit from the presence of team PPL here. Uh, with that, let me just come to the question. The question asked is basically that uh, what if a trust is spending for a charitable purpose which is uh, beyond the mandate of its object? That is the essential question. and. A very clever, uh, uh, you know, example of PM cares have been taken. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so so uh, I can I can tell you, and uh, you all know law better than uh, me that uh, just as Constitution of India is the perimeter in which the governance in the country functions, objects of address are the its constitution. And you have to work within its perimeter. Now, the example cited here is very, very genuine, and it was a global pandemic and extraordinary time. So, I think Team CPL may consider it and uh, may like to see what how best to go forward. But the law is very clear that you have to be within the object of it. I mean, Anurag has uh, rightly pointed out uh, that, uh, you know, if one strictly interprets the law, uh, then law says that uh, you cannot apply uh, any income, any fund, which is not the object of the trust. Now, what is object of the trust? We don't know. Probably some of the trust may find it difficult to explain that uh, whether donating it to a uh, institution uh, whose object does not align with my object uh, uh, so uh, uh, do i violate uh, that clause of object of the trust because that violation means cancellation of registration now not applying your income in accordance with the object of the trust is a serious violation so that is something and as uh, anwa correctly said that you know it they they, they were special times and it is not only for one tax taxpayer virtually everyone was helping the government helping the society and may not be through donation to pm relief fund or pm relief fund only they may be actually putting up uh, some kind of a, 
uh, temporary hospitals, uh, some kind of uh, you know oxygen delivery. There could be many ways in which uh, the help may have been given, and uh, this is uh, for COVID. It could happen for other natural calamities also. Flood uh, could be one, uh, or drought can be one. I mean, these are uh, the issues. Uh, yes, but very rightly pointed out, uh, out by you, and uh, surely we have noted it down, and we will examine it. That how do we need to, you know, uh, uh, consider this uh, without uh, diluting. The main purpose of uh, these provisions that we don't want the trust to deviate from their constitution. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question relates to uh, you know this uh, for the benefit of a particular minority, uh, a religious community or caste. So today, 13.1b, the provision of 13.1b was that. If it is set up for the benefit of any particular community or caste, and set up after 1962. Now here the language is that any income spent for the purpose of uh, 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 benefit of any particular religious community or caste. Now, so there are many societies or uh, organizations which have been set up, uh, which have run minority institutions, education institutions. Uh, there is this concept in the, uh, in the education policy of all uh, states that you have this minority where they are allowed to have a reservation for. A particular, the particular community which has promoted this organization for that particular community. Now, would such a reservation result in uh, you know saying that you are spent only for the benefit of a particular community or caste because you have given preference to them, and therefore can this result in a cancellation of uh, registration under 1280? That is the question. The aspiration we go there. Very valid question, and uh, the answer is not simple. Simple. Again, I will like there is no white, black and white, there is shades of grey. Not fifty, but there are shades of grey. So sorry, that is not true. But uh, seriously, the thing is here that it is a very, very complex issue, debatable issue, prone to litigation. So there are various views, and even though this language is changed, as Dr. Pointed out, in the earlier regime also. There have been litigation, Supreme Court, in Dalkey uh, Hatia, and various other cases where courts have taken a more liberal. So, on such a scenario, I would not like to crystal gaze as to uh, what exactly, uh, how exactly we would interpret. But there, 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 there are uh, you know difference of opinion on this issue, and uh, you know. Uh, courts have also held in various situations differently. Uh, As I said, I mean uh, these are litigations which are currently going on. The department has a view, taxpayers have a view, and uh, for we want the right for us to say which view is the correct view. I mean. Uh, Exactly, as I said, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, that we have a view, uh, we need to, the department has a view that the organization is not in line with uh, uh, how uh, the provisions are given to us by the parliament. Uh, but uh, let's take a view that uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe if I am giving 20% reservation, it doesn't mean that uh, you know I am only for that particular community. I am also having uh, uh, people all over from all over India in that region, 80%. So you know, now, now this is a litigative issue, I and mean, I probably not right for us to say this. And the difference is 13.1b, I can understand, it is set up for the benefit of. So, one can say that it is for everybody, but you have a reservation. Now, here, any part of the income is applied for the benefit of. So that creates a problem. So, even the next question is similar that scholarships, every school, if you go to, if it's a Christian school, they have, say, for the top three party students from the school in this particular examination, they have a prize. Now, you spend for that prize, as for the donor has given this prize award 15 years back, 20 years back. Today, if they spend for that, 
would it amount to uh, you know a violation because they are spending for the business of the community and it's, every industry has this sir again uh, the question is similar the answer cannot be this similar the question sir and team pp said your concern and Uh, the next question is related to uh, uh, you know the provisions of 115 BBI, which was explained uh, very well. Uh, that uh, 115 BBI now requires a rate of uh, 30 percent and uh, you know a flat rate of 30 percent plus applicable surcharge and so. Uh, now this overrides uh, other provisions of the Act and therefore it overrides the provision of Section 1642. Now under the proviso to Section 1642, there is still a maximum marginal rate which applies. Now, in what situation would that apply? I think if that can be clarified, uh, would that apply at all, or is it redundant in that sense? See, 164 provision has a wider application, so that still remains. 164 covers uh, charitable institution also and some other types of income as well, so that also remains. But the proviso is specific to 13.1c or 13.1d. Now that 13.1c and 13.1d are now covered separately under 115 BBI specified income. So to that extent, uh, you can say that because 115 BBI has a non-offset clause, therefore that 115 BBI will apply. That means it will be taxed at 30% at gross level. Though proviso to 1642 says that it will be at maximum marginal rate, which is again 30%, but then it uh, allow you to deduct expenditure. So uh, to that extent, you can say that that proviso has been overridden. But as such, 1642 does not lose its relevance. Uh, the <coughs> the next question is uh, regarding 11 fi- cor- corpus donation. Uh, we are told that it has to be invested in 11 five mode. Now 11 five modes you have immovable property as one of the items in the in in, in the 11 uh, five list. However, you do not have movable properties like say for example MRI machines or ambulances or you know any other equipment that are required by a charitable institution. now so therefore if out of the corpus an investment is made in an ambulance or in an mri machine by a charitable hospital then what is going to happen why i mean uh, uh, is it is it permissible not permissible you will not treat it as corpus what would be the consequence of that uh, and uh, uh, what is happening is that application from corpus we are told that is not going to be treated as application anymore therefore it is neither an application nor it is to be nor the donation is to be treated as corpus donation so uh, what would be the consequence of that can we think of adding to the list of 115 such movable properties which are to be used for the purposes of uh, you know object to the sir the 115 has a specific purpose and that purpose let me explain you is simple that once we give exemption or deduction to trust or institution they do not remain private trust they are public trust the surplus that they are holding they are holding for public it is not for trustee you know all the settlers they have absolutely no right and therefore we have that 133 specified person that you can't uh, give any benefit to a specified person uh, that is the whole objective behind it so now we have not tax your income but you have certain fund we of course that freedom is with the trustee how should that uh, surplus fund be invested but we are also mindful legislature is mindful that if i we are giving you exemption that that surplus must be invested in risk free mode and therefore 115 list all those risk free modes as investment corpus 
can be invested in uh, immovable properties because you require land and building uh, to carry out your business uh, you know now issue is the moment movable property is included in that can we lose that our main objective that uh, you know it should not be on history because what kind of movable property you know example is very well chosen you can say that ambulance is something which is absolutely necessary for the business but obviously you can't write in the law that uh, movable property being ambulance you know uh, because once you put a movable property it can be any other movable property now let us see whether there is a problem at all or not i mean this was my answer whether 115 needs to be expanded but let us see whether there is exactly a problem in this example which is given so example is given that corpus is ambulance i twist it simply in order to explain voluntary contribution is in the form of uh, ambulance so what do we do exactly the law says when you receive voluntary contribution that is 100 is your income and you buy ambulance out of it that is your application so basically when you receive ambulance as voluntary contribution both the things are happening at the same time you receive the uh, uh, you know cost of that uh, or whatever price of that ambulance as voluntary contribution and you have already applied that in the form of purchasing that uh, ambulance uh, you know so both the things are happening at the same time income received and application so there is no problem i mean that must be happening all the time in uh, the trust uh, in the cases of trust or institution and i'm sure you must be exactly doing what i am telling you uh, i mean if there is any other treatment please uh, do bring it uh, you know and correct me now shift to the example that it is not voluntary contribution it is corpus treat it exactly the same i receive a corpus and i made an application out of it the law says that application is not to be counted as application fine but your corpus has increased now the question is corpus has to be maintained in 115 now that is a condition but we also say that once there is an application out of corpus the law does not say it clearly but it is normally understood that once there is an application out of corpus it cannot be 115 simple because you have applied it for charitable purpose for the object of that trust that is condition which must be followed i mean your application must be the object of the trust that is what anurag said is your constitution and you have to be within your constitution so long as you are within uh, you know your application is within the object of the trust we we, we will not ask you that now that your corpus is not under 115 so we will take action no the law says that only thing you make an application out of corpus we will not count it as application that's it next year you recovered it and then you put it in, in that 115 then we will count it as the application so this is clear i mean i i, I don't see any problem here ha uh, huh. yeah yes yeah. see that is what i said that you receive a corpus you put it you receive a voluntary contribution you put in 115 and you make an uh, you, i mean you are not required to put in 115 let's say you put in in uh, any any bank account which is also 115 doesn't matter so and then you make a contribution application out of it to buy an ambulance 
right? That is your application, which is within the object of that person. Now you receive an ambulance. So what do you do? How do you treat it? I have not. I, I, let's not confuse with the corpus. I am saying in a normal your practice. No, 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 no. Once again, you are. You are I am just going one step by one step. You receive your your money, and then you buy ambulance. When you receive money, it is your income. When you buy ambulance, it is your application. But you receive ambulance directly, and it is not corpus. Let us not mix two things. Let us go step by step. You just receive a ambulance. That's all. How do you treat it as you, uh, in your books of account? income and then application so same thing na you are doing the same thing that it is income and then application uh, to my limited understanding what corpus and discharges 111d is liquid fund it can be invested or things which can be if you have got in other modes such as equity shares etc which can be converted so that is the scenario which is being envisaged by the legislature donating an ambulance and saying it is part of the corpus i don't think that is the situation here uh, as you said it may be earmarked fund but there is a difference between earmarked uh, uh, a movable asset And what corpus is? That is my understanding. So, just one uh, point I would like to supplement. So, the normal concept of corpus, as has been held by various courts over the last few decades, has been that for a capital corpus. Now, an ambulance is a capital asset, and therefore, or a MRI machine is a capital asset, and that's what I think the point is. That is, if today, let's put it this way, that sir, if today it is treated as a non-corpus because I have not employed it in eleven five. I should be given a deduction under the which is supposed to not hit me in that situation. So I should, in that sense, it's a income as well as it is an income and an application of income. Then that is not a problem. Okay, I mean, absolutely. See, you treat it as an income and then application of income. I don't think anybody is going to. Uh, I mean, I at least I don't visualize any problem uh, from the income tax department point of view. so therefore answer will be the same as i understand whether i get money and invest in ambulance or whether i get ambulance as a uh, as a donation itself answer will be the same it's not corpus treat it as income and treat that uh, as an expenditure or as an application of the income that's probably yeah. <laughs> okay then so coming to the uh, Books of account. Now, uh, yes, there is that, uh, that the consequence of not maintaining the books of account in accordance with Rule Seventeen Double A should probably be that I am not entitled to the exemption. Now, if you strictly read the rules, I find that there are certain items like item like cash book. Now, I may choose not to maintain a cash book, but I maintain a cash account in the ledger itself. I don't maintain a bank book. I, I maintain a bank account in the ledger itself. Now, when you say cash book also should be maintained, ledger also should be maintained. And I do not maintain cash book. I maintain cash account in the ledger. For the see once again, I don't see it as a fresh uh, issue because even in other provisions of the Income Tax Act, we have prescribed books books of account. Let's give you one example. Rule six F for professionals. We say cash book is to be maintained, ledger is to be maintained. I'm sure uh, many of you. I mean, all of you are professionals. You know it more than me. That uh, when you maintain ledger, have you maintained cash book separately? No. Has any action been taken against you? I mean, I mean these are the things which are already before you. I mean, it's it's normally understood. that if you are already maintaining cash book inside the ledger then the requirement of the law is satisfied
Thank you, sir. We wanted to hear it from you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and the the very charity trust. I I just I just overheard at the time of snack that you are going to retire in two years. So on behalf of on behalf of chamber, I would invite you to the to the side of the chamber, which are which are a charitable organization, so that we have less difficulty with the department. <laughs> So, well, similarly, uh, 17AA also has one very omnibus clause there, which says any other book that may be required to be maintained in order to keep true and fair view of the state of affairs. Now, it is fine that anything that is required to give true and fair view, the implementation of this, that the assessing office is required, and you have not maintained. Now, and and uh, if he says that okay, you ought to you ought to have maintained this and you have not maintained, so this subjectivity may lead to some sort of a friction, you know, uh, litigation. So we need to uh, salvage that. We need to I mean, considering the fact that we are dealing with charity, the fact that. Charity. This needs to be, uh, you know, some sort of a medium. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, when we inserted this particular clause, uh, we didn't have anything in our mind uh, that, uh, you know, that assessing officer is going to tell you which books to be maintained. Our idea was that uh, you may require. I mean, you are your best judge. You may require, you know, some uh, books to be maintained, but uh, I mean. When you pointed this out to us, probably we will have a look uh, so that it is, uh, you know, correctly interpreted. Uh, I mean, the intention is not that uh, uh, we are going to sit in judgment that what book you should maintain. Idea is that whatever transactions you are undertaking, whatever books are required to be maintained for that purpose, you should maintain. That was our purpose. We will have a discussion internally if this is going to create any issue uh, to the people in general. Just to supplement, as I understand it, it is actually a, a beneficial provision in the sense that it gives you the flexibility to maintain the way in which you want, so that your state of affairs can be reflected. Now, I don't envision a scenario where AO is going to say you have to maintain in this format and not in that format. As long as it is reflecting the true state of affairs, so I mean, of course, they will have a discussion. From, but from the field side, I can tell you uh, that uh, there have been plethora of judgments where the courts have held that the AOs cannot put themselves in the shoes of businessmen and tell them how to run their state of affairs. So similarly, here you decide what is the best way to maintain, present it to us, and reflective of your true state of affairs. And I think we are good to go. Uh, then uh, uh, another issue is actually arising out of the requirement of uh, income being treated or at being uh, uh, required to be offered on accrual basis and expenditure or the application on the basis of actual spending. Now, uh, uh, the, the law now is very clear that. You know there are silos created. One is a silo of the regular income we earned during the current year. One is the past year's income. One is the corpus donation, and one is the borrowing. And I need to have a data or record in respect of receipts and the corresponding expense out of each of these receipts. So, uh, so the question would arise that you know if I have in my regular income a fixed deposit in a bank and I receive interest on it. But that interest is accrued, and until 31st of March, it is not received. And because uh, it is not received, yet on an accrual basis, it forms part of my income. And in case the uh, the the, the uh, uh, application falls short of 85 percent, there would be an addition during the year. So therefore, the tendency would be that I would uh, spend either from a borrowing or from the corpus. But then that would not be permitted in that first year, and then in the first year I would be facing tax. 
And yes, in the next year when I replenish it, probably you will give me a deduction. But then this is a, this is on account of the fact that the income is taxed on an accrual basis, and it's an application is on cash basis. And uh, therefore, I mean, is there a way out to deal with this? Before Kamlesh gives his expert view, I'll give you the field view here. Uh, I don't see again a problem here. As far as the second regime is concerned, you have Form 9A. You can go with it. In the first regime, presently, Form 9A is not there. Uh, probably that is one of the variants, uh, minor variants still there. Maybe it may not be there uh, next year, who knows. Uh, but Certainly, Form 10 is there. Nothing prevents you from filing Form 10, 11, 2 and expending it in next year, just as you would Form 9. So, where is the issue here? So, uh, I mean, it is very well made by Anurag uh, that uh, 9A is there. You can use 9A. That means you can, uh, you know, if you are accounting your income on accrual basis. Uh, then in Form 9A uh, gives you an option that uh, you count it in the year in which you receive, you actually spend the money. Uh, you know, so uh, that kind of freedom is given there. So you can use of uh, that opportunity. Uh, that is one. And then even if that is not there in uh, the first regime, uh, probably it is for legislature to consider whether they want to introduce in the first regime. That's a different question. But even otherwise, if you are not able to five percent, then uh, there is an opportunity for you to accumulate and spend within five years. Now you can do that. In addition, there is an option that you can also convert to the cash system for even repeat of you know, but that is a question. you have to that fits into the ethos of your organization or not. Why we brought uh, you know, now this is the possibility of answers that are before you for you to consider. But uh, I can also give you a background why we said or made it clear because uh, you know we have judgment also uh, both ways. Uh, but uh, we are of the view that uh, actual, the actual spend application must be on actual basis. Once again, the logic is same that. You are a public trust. Whatever money you receive or the income you earn has to be spent for public good. It has to be spent, not on books. Accrual is spending in books, not on ground. What legislature wants you to do is you spend on ground, not in books. That this is to be outstanding. You know, this is not what legislature wants. That money has to be spent. And we do understand the difficulty that you can't uh, receive income and spend immediately. And therefore, that 85% is given. You know, that 15% every year, you know, if you accumulate for 10 years, it becomes a big money, actually, if you see from that perspective. Practically, we do not see, and with these three options that we discussed, that there would be a real issue when a charitable active, uh, you know, trust is doing actual charitable activities. When they actually want to spend for the public, if they want to just accumulate and create reserves and surpluses, now that is uh, obviously not an objective for uh, trust. That is not an objective for commercial organization. Absolutely, they are commercial organizations are formed for that purpose, but not trust and institutions. I mean, that's a basic difference. That will make it more complicated. The idea is that no, no, then 85% uh, uh, will be removed. No, the, the, then 85% will be removed. No, no, then that 15% benefit that is being given, that will have to be removed. No, that is your view. I, I am pretty sure. No, 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 no. 
but what i'm saying now that you you what what i'm saying the other person who will say no 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 let the 15% be there ha ha uta to rehne do ha No, 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 you can't have both words. Fifteen percent is given to you for exactly this reason. You are saying that I want fifteen percent also, and I want forty-three B also. Both cannot happen. No, no, no. If both form nine and form ten are such simple forms, and on your heart you tell me how much time you need to in that form. No, no. Problem. The problem. Problem is section eight. Sorry. No, no, section eight companies and section twenty-five companies don't have that option. They will have to follow a cruel system, and that is the whole problem. So uh, the problem difficulty is uh, the reconciliation has to be maintained. What has been claimed in the books? What has been allowed for income tax? What is the balance amount? So that is where the problem is, and that's why he's saying that if if so long as you spend it before the uh, due date of filing of the return, just like in 43B, it will elevate the difficulty substantially. It will remove the expense substantially because you are giving only effectively six months more time to spend that. That's all. Actually, pay it out. When you claim accumulation in Form 10, and you claim all the time, so you maintain that reconciliation for five years. I think the similar logic applies. So while this conversation was on, I was just wondering: Do we really need these two in green? I mean, uh, any thoughts on this? Good question. I would also like to hear the answer. So it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it is it is very clear that uh, uh, you know two regimes are not needed. So basically, we thought about it, but uh, if legislature had withdrawn one of the regime, they would have been used. Right. So what we did, uh, what legislature did last year, is that try to bring them at the at par with each other. Of course, they are still uh, like nine A is not there. And thirteen one C is not there. You know those things are still there. One or two, uh, just major points. But but most of the uh, issues they have been brought at par. And now in the par uh, parliament, you know, uh, like uh, we have to be present in the parliament. It's part of our duty. Whenever you know uh, the taxation bill, finance bill, or taxation law amendment bill is discussed in parliament, we have to be in parliament. So I noticed. I don't remember the name of that honourable MP, but one MP said exactly said the same thing that uh, remove one regime now. Now both are same. So that is a you know feeling of the legislature. So now it is for legislature to take a call. Can I ask one question? Since you've been firing all the time, uh, for 1023C regime, what kind of Application is happening outside India. Is any substantial application happening? So in the 1023C regime, what is happening is I think uh, some of these uh, schools are particularly they are setting up schools overseas, also particularly Dubai, etc. I think because under FEMA now that is permitted uh, overseas education is something which is being permitted. So that is something. Uh, so therefore, there that also needs to come into play. Today it is only for welfare of India. You know, we can be the thing to do. There, that needs to be with eleven one C needs to be amended to say that any purpose which the CBD team has. So that is a. Okay, on the date of applicability of seventeen double eight, the rule comes into effect from tenth of August twenty two. 
and uh, the trust will have to get geared up uh, for whatever shortfall whatever uh, they have not been doing uh, it needs to do it so uh, <coughs> uh, what according to the department to the effective date will be needed to be financially at 2023 as a whole will it be uh, uh, that is will it be assessed at 23 24 which means that even for the period from 1st of april 22 to 10th of august 22 i need to maintain and on the contrary uh, so far as trusts are concerned they will need some time to gear up and therefore is there any case to say that okay we let us uh, uh, let us uh, make it applicable from the next financial year any thoughts on this i'm just trying to see the basic legislation what was the date of effective no 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 not 17 level a yeah assessment year 23 24 so the legislature is that assessment year 23 24 is the uh, uh, you know uh, is the date from which this provision uh, comes into force Uh, so rule 17 double a also comes into force from that day so delegated legislation you know we have to follow the main legislation so assessment year 23 24 that is the current financial year uh, you are required to maintain books of account of course uh, you know it uh, comes into the operation uh, from the date of uh, its uh, gazette notification so that means you are required to maintain books of account from right now uh, that is what the law says that is how the law is and now if uh, any relief is to be given that needs to be considered by cbdt uh, but uh, the as i said earlier you probably need to for claiming any relief you need to point out that in 17 double a notification which is a books of account which you were not keeping it earlier it was not required to be kept earlier to calculate your taxable income so if you are already keeping having the number you know only th- only thing it is not that systematic you can always make it systematic i mean I, that is not a great uh, burden It's because you already have the number Okay. Uh, so I think uh, one of the uh, items in sem- Rule Seventeen Double A talks about uh, record of income, which is voluntary contribution containing details of name of the donor, address, plan, if available, and Aadhaar number if available. Uh, so therefore, you are required, uh, you know, uh, to all institutions is applied, including religious trust, say, for instance, which get uh, donations in uh, hundi boxes, etc. Now, how does one maintain? It's not possible for such donations which are, you know, for religious trust, more than five DBC does not apply. Sir. So it applies only to charitable organizations or partly charitable, and partly religious, where it is received for hospital or education institutions. So therefore, how is it practically possible to maintain this for, uh, you know, religious trust, where it is in the very nature anonymous uh, donation? The answer lies in question only. because if it is religious trust and uh, 115 dbc does not apply then probably this in the record of voluntary contribution uh, those will be lumped as anonymous donations if there is a better way then i would like to be educated no so i i see your point you are making is basically if it is an anonymous donation i don't know the name Uh, and the pen of the donor. How do I fulfil the requirement of 17 level A 
so we see a point here uh, we just noted down and uh, we will see uh, i think sir uh, you have answered the point already regarding this uh, uh, limit of two and a half lakhs i think that has been the next point is about books required to be kept at the registered office now there is no concept of registered office in trust and i'd like for company which is there so uh, can it be broad based uh, you know uh, so any address which will mention the return of income etc secondly also so that resolution you know for today for current year when should the resolution be passed so for the current year you know you need to give time to trust to be able to comply with that so that is the other uh, request we will give you a choice to select a registered office uh, we are in the process of coming out with the, the audit form and we will give you an option to select uh, give, give you must select what is your registered office uh so the next question is regarding this uh, you know where the specified person registered required maintain so there is no problem maintaining of settler of trustee or managing committee member etc that is not a problem the problem really is on the donor and you are saying the donor who from the inception of the trust has given total donation more than 50000 so now that so 50000 limit was fixed way back in 1995 so it is 27 years old. 50000 today has got uh, is nothing to this so thank you sir i mean and if you step up, somebody who given donation of 5000 rupees every year for last 10 years it's covered now which is i think uh, and therefore this is something which is becoming an impossible requirement for trust to comply with so unless you have a software which specifically uh, is tailored for trust uh, to do this uh, so there can something be done on that front uh, on the uh, uh, limit so maybe that limit should be 10 lakhs in today's environment uh, you know that could be something uh, i mean your point is uh, you know well made uh, we do understand that because last time this 50000 was done in 1995 so you have a point all you can say any change would require uh, amendment it is an amendment in law but because you know or it could be pending for your for a particular year if at a particular year you get one donation or a total cumulative donation in a particular so maintaining a cumulative throughout the lifetime is uh, extremely difficult task here. that is the whole uh, okay so um, yeah so 15 is there Uh, I need to. One of the items in the list of seventeen uh, AA is the the uh, uh, purpose for or the where when I'm making an application of income towards what objects I'm making that application has to be stated. Now, whenever there is a specific object, fine, I can always uh, uh, have that uh, accumulated somewhere or in separate ledger account. I can do it, but. all expenses of administrative nature of the trust are are indeed towards the objects of the trust but i cannot identify uh, any specific object so it may not be possible for me to say for each and every item of expenditure that it is which, which is towards which object so to that extent this particular requirement may have to be read down or may have to be uh, you know construed liberally so what's your thought process on i think uh, uh there are direct expense there you can write so that it is for that project and indirect expense you can write uh, you know a salary income of uh, the common people uh, you can write in the general expense for all are you understanding that each and every expense has to be allocated to that so essentially he said you can read it down so uh, on the corpus donation thing i mean a practical difficulty which i should just like point out and it could be addressed is on the corpus donations uh, for assessment year 22 23 i think most trusts are not be able to file the returns because of these 
uh, utility, the way it is uh, picking up the past, uh, you know, spending on corpus is being treated as income in the current year, effectively. Uh, so that is something if it can be looked into at the earliest so that uh, this utility can be, uh, you know, at least if it could be manually fed in, you know, certain fees, because otherwise that, because the biggest problem sir, is that that deficit, uh, it is there in your income and expenditure account, in all those cases, even if you have 10,000 rupees deficit, that the you cannot enter it at all in the balance sheet. There's no provision in the balance sheet. Either. That is easy. So I can't enter a negative figure in my reserves and surplus. But at the same, same time, I cannot uh, enter it on the asset side. So some practical way needs to be found out for that. Otherwise, the returns are going to be held up for this year. So we, we probably will understand why there is a negative, you know, and then we'll take it up with the CPP, you know, how this is to be resolved. We will uh, take it. Probably you may like to send a detailed uh, uh, email. Uh, Question number 17 has been covered about uh, corporate donation, uh, uh, you know, where corporate donation is utilized for revenue expenses and then, uh, you know. The, uh, the hospital maintaining donation box at various locations, uh, you mentioned that such donation for corporate, uh, whether it would be regarded as anonymous donation, uh, you know, that was the question which uh, I think this is. Uh, an issue which is really not under the amended law, so I don't think let's not uh, do this. This is uh, uh, point number 19 also about uh, spending before the due date of filing of return. That also I think we've covered that. We have covered that. So, this question about this uh, deficit not being allowed to be carried forward. Uh, the question is uh, that what happens to the deficit of 21-22? Can I adjust it for 22-23 or from 22-23 itself? That is, uh, at the end of 21-22, assessment year 21-22 has lapsed. That's the question which uh, uh, one of the participants has raised. Yeah, I spoke. I, I mean, uh, when Neha was making presentation, I tried to explain that. I can again, uh, you know, explain it. Uh, that uh, you know, how do you read explanation four? So you read explanation four that. Uh, uh, whatever you uh, withdraw from corpus for, for application, it will not be counted. Assessment year 22-23 is the first year from which the new law, new explanation for will apply. When you use loans and borrowing for application, it is not counted. When you have a broad forward loss, you cannot allow to set off. So that is the assessment year 22-23 and onwards, all these three a uh, new law will apply. So that means whatever prior year your excess application or what you call deficit or loss, uh, that will not be allowed to be adjusted uh, from assessment year 22-23. That is how I read the law. Uh, the next question has been covered uh, already in the course of discussion about uh, corpus donation uh, and uh, investment in removal property, etc. All that, I think, uh, that I think completes uh, the various questions which are raised. So let me cover some of the questions uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Bipin Agarwal had raised, though I may have already covered them, but uh, still, in case anything is left out. So his uh, first question was explanation for clause four uh, maintained specifically for such corpus 11 one uh, you know that amount to be invested and maintained specifically for such purpose. The issue is whether kept in saving bank account in which minimum equivalent to capital to corpus received is whether it is suffice for the condition or it has to be kept separately in FD bond. See. Uh, Bank account with scheduled bank is one of the method in 11.5. So that means if you keep in saving bank account, you are satisfying 11.5, but it has to be specifically. Specifically means that uh, the new corpus, whatever new corpus you are receiving or recouping, uh, that must be a separate kind of a bank account, separate bank account number kind of a thing. 
so where we can identify that this is separate but saving bank account is one of the 115 mode so it should not be a problem keeping it in saving bank account whether the set amount is to be kept specifically for the amount received in financial year 2122 uh, that i answered earlier that no 2122 or earlier year corpus this requirement was not there you already mixed it with your general fund and uh, law allowed corpus to be not counted as income so that period is over so this is a new law 11 new 11 1d applies only from assessment year 22 23 then 11 2 in respect of accumulation it is already mentioned that the accumulated amount is to be invested or deposited in the most specified in section 11 5 however it has not been mentioned that it is to be specifically maintained separately that's correct so if it is not mentioned you don't have to mention uh, you know maintain it specifically the word specifically is only for corpus and i explained you when neha was making presentation i explained you why why that word specifically is there the reason behind it so it is only for corpus there is mo no mention regarding 15 percent amount set apart is to be kept separately as been mentioned in the explanation so there is no need to keep it specific though it will be kept in mode as per 11.5 uh, that, I mean, that is correct that I just explained. So, there is no uh, word specific there. In case of corpus invested specifically, it can be construed that only interest income can be used for the purpose of application, not the original amount of corpus. So, you have corpus, uh, you have invested in 11.5 mode specifically. Fine. Interest income will go into your common hotspot whatever you know is your common hotspot is that 100 percent and from there you have to spend 85 percent uh, you know and if you don't spend 85 percent uh, you have to file form 10 so that rule will apply you know interest income on your corpus will go to that uh, fund and it is not uh, uh, you know uh, you it may happen that uh, you know it is it is part of your fd getting uh, you know uh, accumulated but the require, there is no requirement that it must be kept specifically. It will be counted in that 100%. And whether, uh, you know, uh, PSU bonds are uh, or, or, or not. So PSU, uh, you know, uh, we have said that the public sector undertaking bonds are one of the method in 11.5. So if a union bank is a public sector undertaking, you have to check whether it is a public sector undertaking. Then, uh, you know, uh, uh, the bond issued by that uh, public sector you can invest. You know, but that is, I think that is counted as equity. It is, isn't it counted in uh, basal norms as a capital? Huh? It is counted as capital. Huh? No, no, but it is part of capital. I mean, it is not actually bond. You may call it bond. Huh? So I think there is a doubt there whether it can be counted as 11.5 because it is it is not actually uh, the bond, uh, the how we read 11.5. See, court might take one view or the other. We, we uh, I mean, I, I don't know. But I'm just giving you the policy perspective. The policy perspective of 11.5 is that it should be in risk-free instrument and therefore bond. Now, this year two bonds issued by the banks are counted as uh, capital for Basel uh, three norms. So, and and you also lose money also. You know, when if a bank have to write off, the first write off is uh, tier two capital. So, I mean, objective I have told you, I mean, somebody wants to take a chance and uh, think that it can win in court, then that, that is up to that person. From our point of view, it's basically not a safe instrument. Huh? So you liquidate within one year? 
So that, no, no, no. So what you should do is that you should sell that off. Uh, you know, there is a loss. There is a loss. I mean, uh, that is uh, something uh, which was uh, not in your hands. But the requirement of 11.5 is that you must convert equity within 12 months into uh, the you know 11.5 mode. I don't know. I mean, uh, that is something. I, uh, Are you a trustee? Is it possible? I mean, I don't know if uh, in one bank account you can have two branches of that bank account. I don't know. I mean, whether you can have. No, no, I, I don't think so. Because then it becomes a common hotspot. You can't. It will not qualify as specifically. In one bank, you can have two accounts. I have. I, I mean, I have two accounts in one bank. It so happened that Syndicate Bank got merged with Canada Bank, so now I have two accounts. So I assume that you can have two accounts in one bank. So that you can have. That is there is nothing wrong in it. It also happen say for instance I have a corpus of 50 lakh and general investor of 50 and there's only one fixed deposit. I can germa saying that 50 lakh is towards the corpus and 50 lakh is towards my general. So that is also something which is uh, you know so the similar manner if on the account also if this germa thing is done in the account that is something which is But is it allowed in 11.5? What mutual funds are allowed? There, there are certain mutual funds under 11.5 CBDT can notify. So certain mutual funds have been notified. You'll have to look at the notification and find out whether that specific mutual fund is notified under 11.5. Under income tax by the CBDT notification. You see, 11.5 itself in the Act, it, is, it says that it, uh, any other investment which is notified in this regard. Yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, uh, thanks for pointing it out. Uh, so we will have a look at that. One last, uh, uh, you know, remark from my side, uh, and this is to all the practitioners on the trust side in Mumbai city. See, uh, from the office of CIT exemptions Mumbai, we have issued uh, notices in several hundred cases 
for processing form 10 ab applications for conversion from provisional to regular and more than 1000 applications are you know getting barred by limitation in coming months in most of the cases we find that you all have not submitted form 10 ac along with your application now that form 10 ac visibility is not there to me it is only to you and without form 10 ac i cannot proceed so this is my humble request to all of you and to you to all the trust that kindly uh, you know respond to our query and we have also issued several questionnaires kindly respond to them on time because not just you have to be on time but i also have to issue those uh, uh, registrations within 6 months from the your date of filing so i just solicit uh, cooperation from all of you in this regard thank you then form 10 dd be right so the act says that a correction statement can be filed in regard to 10 dd where you can either update it or you can either uh, rectify it so it's given in the act second question is someone has given a receipt for it so the second dd is given a receipt
so what is meant by each project so is it activity wise is it so different objects of the class if there is one object but there are multiple activities is specific the activity or specific the object itself overall object yes okay project so your project will be activity na i mean what activity you are taking that activity will be for fulfillment of one of your object correct so did you did you have to mention details regarding each separate project or is it is to lump all projects regarding no 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 separate project does the provision of section 115 has to be checked for the whole year or at the end of the year on the last date of the balance no no that has to be checked for the whole year i mean you can't uh, uh, you know take out uh, on 1st april uh, and put it back on 31st march a school has a, uh, a school having around 8000 students get to see the online so according to the new requirement whether serial wise receipt or bill has to be kept or how how would such accounting for multiple uh, numerous frequency of receipt be maintained i mean see naturally you issue them a receipt so you just have to maintain that receipt book i mean just like uh, normally you do it how how you do it uh, basically you don't issue them receipt book you issue. do you issue them at the end of the year i mean i don't know yeah ha huh, electronic records are suffice yes so uh, while the income tax act allows investment in mutual fund for a trust as for the gujarat trust tax investment in mutual fund is not allowed in such a scenario what is to be done no no violation of any law we have said it clearly that was a amendment in 2019 that violation of any law which has been confirmed by the court then you know there is a failure and now we have included that in specified violation that means your registration will be cancelled next question is that in the new itr 7 we have to fill the balance sheet of the trust in in section 11 subsection 2 in respect of the accumulation it is already mentioned that uh, the accumulated amount is to be invested or deposited in the most specified however it has not been mentioned it has been specifically mentioned separately yes i have answered that it is not mentioned so it is not mentioned it is only for corpus and even for the similar that 15% amount there is no requirement to keep it separately 15% so there is no requirement for 115 Uh, what will be the remedy or course of action for a charitable trust which has not filed form 10a or for ACG certificate before 31st March 2022? Okay. 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 Uh, no, to my end, even for that 15 percent, 11.5 mode has to be adhered to. So you got that. so far that the view which has been taken all along that uh, it's all the amounts uh, of the of the funds of the trust have to be in the mode to set on the 11 5 okay. uh, then i stand corrected uh, what is the remedy or course of action for a charitable trust which has not filed form 10a for atg certificate before 31st march 2022 The 31st March 2022 was the extended date, second extension for Form 10A to be filed. So as of now, there is no window available for the taxpayer to file. So that is the situation, and we have received various references in this regard, and we have sent it to CBDT. All the prayers for condonation, etc., which have come from the taxpayer. So. pending any notification or condemnation from cbdt presently they cannot file the window is not there so uh, then probably that your question because as anurag and others have corrected me uh, that all funds are to be invested in 115 uh, though specifically is only for corpus so that your earlier question of 20 rupees then then entire 20 rupees should get taxed under 13 1d 
Uh, the audit report for the trust uh, is it to be uploaded before the due date for filing the return of income, or is it sufficient that the audit op report is obtained and it is mentioned that uh, it's the same, it does the same as being done? Amendment has been made by Finance Act 2020. So it is aligned with the other one one month prior to the due date of the filing of the return. Section 12A uh, relevant section can be seen. Uh, if the trust has a pan with the four digit being off, it indicates form, how, how can this problem be resolved? If the old pan is cancelled and new pan is obtained, what would be the status of the old investment, uh, old assessment, and old uh, pending refunds and litigation? It is a technical issue, so I would not be in a position to clearly say how the migration has to happen or what the procedure requirement is. So this is a problem. I think in the past, PAN numbers have been allotted to various trusts, uh, you know, the C or F, etc., and then they have applied for a new receipt because otherwise they could not file Form 7 electronically. Now, the problem really is that the data, which is the TDS data migration or this, the system needs to lay down some procedure whereby pan, old pan can be migrated to a new pan which they have got and cancel the old pan. You know, so something like that needs to be laid down it is in the system. One workaround uh, we found, there was one, this case, where the TDS was in the old pan and uh, that was deactivated because the pan. So that was deactivated, but it was claimed in the new pan. So what was done was with the higher approval of uh, uh, the range head, the Chalan detail data is modified and the pan is changed and then the refund was issued in the new pan. But depending on what kind of specific scenario it is there, this may not be a solution for each and every case. Uh, so that will need to be taken up individually. So this is a problem for other cases also. So between, say, for instance, the deceased person and the executor, etc., the system needs to lay down a system where the PAN can be, the TDS can be transferred to the. Uh, so this is a common problem with this case. Hmm. The next question is that if the corporate donation receipt is kept in a common bank account, will it be considered compliant? That is part of the project uh, continuation. Uh, if the trust has not applied for pre registration in PNA for ATG, it was, uh, as it was maybe interesting that only one application under 12AA and ATG is sufficient. There is no window left. We missed out. One comment is about merging the registry. Is it possible for charitable trusts to hold only beneficial interest in equity shares of public company where shares are actually held by the promoters? In such case, only dividend will be received by the trust. However, voting power and other material rights will be with the promoters itself. Not allowed. Not allowed. Uh, section 1023 uh, 14 proviso, which is about accumulation of donation paid to another NPO, appears, appears to overlap with explanation 4D in uh, proviso 3. Between the 14 proviso to 1023 C, we have to overlap with explanation 4D to proviso 3. Can the department create a specific hotline or email ID where NGOs can see clarifications or queries with quick turnaround? We we have a help desk of the department, and uh, that help desk is increasingly, uh, you know, improving with uh, uh, customer service experience. I can say so. We have been uh, actually centric each and every day. We are trying to. Know, create systems and structures where uh, we are able to resolve. Uh, but yes, there are there are issues, and uh, we are trying to improve. Uh, so there is one comment which says that we are unable to pay late filing fees under Section 234 as tax payment. Uh, there is one
the next comment is there are certain conditions in form 10 ac which need to go beyond section 12a for example this has, this has been clarified by sir 11 There is a request for all opinions in different forms. Yeah, plus, uh, uh, and there is, there is this clarification from my side, which is a disclaimer that all these uh, views which we have, we have shared are not official views of income tax department. These are our personal views as students of law, just like all of you. I will, uh, before I thank you uh, formally, I have put two questions from my side regarding the three budgets of uh, taxation. Uh, in one of the budgets, it is mentioned that the net income is allowed, but that expenditure has to be not in the form of contribution or donation to any person. Now, if I am a trust and I am giving scholarships to students or I am giving medical relief to patients if uh, they approach me, then why it should not be allowed? So let us try to understand. We have allowed donation to similar trust and institution having same object out of your current income, but we have not allowed out of accumulation, right? So from current year you can do it because from accumulation if you allow, then uh, you know that five years will be defeated because you can actually chain it out so that is the logic why from current year income it is allowed but from accumulation it is not allowed now if also from net income taxability it is not allowed why it is not allowed because as i said earlier that the provisions of trust are different from provisions of commercial enterprise because in commercial enterprise you have expenditure to earn income here you have income first, then application. Now, because of that basic difference between the two, the moment you tax them, there is a violation. That means books of accounts are not kept, audited, not done. So you go to uh, that uh, basket where you are taxed on net basis. So first benefit that we have given to you is that your application is taken as expenditure. So it is not under 3757 but we take it as your expenditure. So when we take it as an expenditure, then uh, 37 and 57 does not allow donation uh, as expenditure. So when we give you a benefit, we have to give it properly. And therefore we allow all that 40 AI and all that also there, 40 A and all so, that. Uh, not a donation, sir. So today if I give, say a beggar, I give him some money. I mean, so people all on the street who are wishing I give, so, but this is a contribution to that person, sir. That is the thing we can be because it is a person. That is what the point is. See, thirteen ten gives a very specific. It's a specific code, and it says what you can include, what you can exclude. So, earlier there was so much of confusion. Now it has legislature in its wisdom has thought that when you make contribution to other trust, that needs to be excluded. And sir, one final question in the next budget, uh, violation of any law which is not disputed is in fine or is the final. I am a hospital, I have got an ambulance, it was taking away a patient and it was parked in a no parking area. There was a violation. No, no, you have you have conveniently missed to put one important <laughs> phrase there in that law. It says which is material for the purpose of achieving the object of the trust. So if that if that uh, accident was material, then it would apply. For the intention, it was material. <laughs> anyway, uh, I thank each one of you for uh, sharing your personal views. And uh, obviously, the request for written opinions is uh, out of question. And I have got some complaints about the audio not being uh, audible in uh, certain cases. Uh, while we apologize for the technical uh, uh, effect, uh, I would urge you that you please come down to our Mumbai Academy. You are welcome for all sessions. <laughs> and I will request uh, raise by to Professor Veldigar Water Thank you.
friend uh, you will all agree with these uh, the the today session which covers basically you know with the which we all agree that you know the, for the first time we have the the provisions explained last two years amendment explained by the uh, 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 neha madam with a very very a very very crisp, a simple manner and the and the logic and the perception of the department or the uh, the logic and the intention behind the law amendment and all, and and the queries all the queries you know and each and every query queries has been solved by the amlesh ji and the anurag ji in a very lucid manner and and in very in the depth answer with the logical conclusions has been drawn and whatever the conclusion which is not to be drawn it has been noted down and will be dealt with in due, due course of time that is also as you have been given and definitely we will consider as and all the personal views of the uh kamlesh ji and anurag ji for dealing with the queries and we thank i i thank on behalf of the ifa and all the uh chief ctc members member uh, ctc for the, uh, for this session and also thank the uh, uh yogesh yogesh bhai and the gautam bhai for sharing their such valuable time and and the taking up the all these queries in a in a right manner that's all and thank you for all the part last of the list all the participants physical participants and the and the venue uh, virtual participants who attended the program with a uh, so interesting manner thank you